Hi, everyone. Welcome to the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition 2013 webinar series sponsored by Genentech. We have over 200 people registered for this webinar, and so we only have um, about almost half of that. So we're going to give it about five more minutes, um, and then we'll start shortly. Thank you. For those people who just logged on, welcome to the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition 2013 webinar series sponsored by Genentech. We're still waiting for um, a couple more people to log on and participate, so we're just going to give about a couple more minutes and then we'll start. Thank you.
For those who just joined, welcome to the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition 2013 webinar series sponsored by Genentech. Still waiting for a couple more people to log in and we'll start in the next few minutes. Thank you. Okay, we're going to begin. Welcome to the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition 2013 webinar series sponsored by Genentech. This evening, the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition and Meals to Heal will be presenting a two-part webinar series. Part one tonight is called Fitting Healthy Behaviors into a Busy Lifestyle for Ovarian Cancer Survivorship. Part two will be June 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern, Creating an Action Plan for Healthy Living. The webinar tonight will be conducted by Oncology Registered Dietitian Jessica Ayanada, Chief Clinical Officer with Meals to Heal. Jessica is currently responsible for all clinical operations at Meals to Heal, a complete solution to the needs of cancer patients, evidence-based information, access to credentialed nutrition professionals, and affordable delivery of fresh, healthy, and well-balanced meals. Jessica? Hi everyone and welcome. I'm so glad to be with you all tonight. Today we're going to be talking about nutrition on the fast track. So what do we think of when we think of fast track? Well, what comes to my mind, obviously, is a car. So just like a car, we actually need to fuel our bodies to stay healthy. What would happen if you put 87 octane fuel in a car that actually required 91 octane? Well, we would think it might be okay one or two times, but probably if you did it consistently, you would A, get less miles per gallon, and B, likely destroy your engine. So why does this even matter? Well, we can think of nutrition very similar to how we put energy or fuel into a car. We actually burn fuel for energy as well, not only to supply our body with nutrients for energy, but also better cognition, enhanced immunity, and even healthier skin and nails. Eating properly will help us to decrease inflammation. It'll help your body to fight chronic diseases such as cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and the list goes on and on. So what are some common concerns for ovarian cancer patients and survivors? I've worked in oncology for a number of years, so I've seen pretty much seen all of the issues that patients address. Number one. Many patients and survivors often struggle with weight management and nutritional issues. This can occur before, during, and after treatment. Often, patients are also very confused with the wealth of health information out there. What is the best diet? And that's probably the number one question that I get asked. How do I lose weight? What about dietary supplements? And of course, how much do I need to exercise? So what are some of the common obstacles to healthy eating? And these are the common things that I see in cancer survivors. Number one, a lot of times patients experience taste changes after treatment. They may also have persistent side effects. What about time? Fatigue? Lack of cooking skills? How many of you out there are emotional eaters? And what about people who are eating on the run? Convenience? Juggling our needs? And not to mention how many people are bombarded with cookies, cakes, gifts at the office, or people who are sending well wishes. 
So the first key component that we're going to talk about tonight is energy balance. Nutrition is so important, not only for consuming proper calories for energy, but ideally to be balanced with energy expenditure. So when we take too much in, but don't expend enough energy, what happens? We're going to be gaining weight. When we take too little in, then what occurs? We expend energy, and then we're going to be losing weight. So why is this so important with cancer? The theory is, is that hormones are stored in our body fat. The more body fat, potentially, the more estrogen that's stored. This can actually increase our risk of hormone-related cancers. Tonight, I'm going to give you some practical techniques about how to achieve and maintain a healthy weight, how to achieve that proper energy balance. Two key components to that include higher fiber and lower fat intake. So when we talk about higher fiber intake, first we want to aim for at least 25 to 35 grams per day. An easy way to do this would be to choose mostly whole grains or complex carbohydrates. And of course, including a variety of fruits and vegetables, which are also great sources of dietary fiber. We also want to avoid simple carbohydrates. These are the empty calories that don't give our body any added nutrition and essentially are just empty energy that we don't need. Lower fat intake, and I know this is probably a common technique or term that people use when they're trying to achieve a healthy weight. This can be achieved by choosing lean proteins, avoiding unnecessary added fats, and choosing lower fat or non-fat dairy products. One thing that's most important when talking about lower fat intake is to be mindful of hidden sources of fat. Because believe it or not, fat has actually more than two times the calories as carbohydrates in the high fiber foods. So there can be a lot of sources of hidden calories. So let's get into some more specifics about dietary fiber. I know you've all seen the term whole grain, multigrain, whole wheat. All of these terms are very popular in the foods that we buy these days. Believe it or not, the term whole grain is actually not a regulated term, and it can be quite misleading. I'm sure you've all seen on the supermarket shelves things like whole grain chips ahoy or whole grain white bread. Now, does that really sound healthy? Definitely not. So let's look at the anatomy of a grain. What is actually a grain? Well, a grain is actually a seed. So if we think of the parts of a seed, we have the bran, and that protects the outer part of the seed. And then the germ is the part that actually nourishes the seed. These two parts are full of phytonutrients and vitamins that are very, very important and have lots of cancer-fighting properties. The endosperm, which is the inner part that supplies energy to the seed, contains some protein and B vitamins and mostly carbohydrate. So believe it or not, the healthiest part of the seed, that bran and germ, is actually what's removed when whole grains are refined. So how do you know whether or not you're getting a refined whole grain? These are some of the common words that you'll see on a food label. You may see whole grain or whole wheat, and that means that all of the parts of the grain should be intact in that product. If you see something that says just wheat or semolina, flour, multigrain, likely that food doesn't contain all of the parts of the grain. Enriched wheat flour, bran, and wheat germ are also foods or components of a food that signify that it likely doesn't have all of the parts of the grain. So just make sure that if it's going to say 100% whole wheat or whole grain, then then that means that actually it's 100% of that grain. So, how else do we get dietary fiber? Another big, big component of our diet that can provide dietary fiber and healthful plant and cancer-fighting properties is fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables are actually my most favorite topic to talk about. And the reason for that is because they provide such a rainbow of nutrients. 
All fruits and vegetables contain these potential cancer-fighting phytonutrients, or better known as plant chemicals. It's very important to eat a variety of varying colors. This actually helps you to ensure that you're including the spectrum of phytochemicals and antioxidants that your body might need. So let's think of some of the colors of the rainbow. When we think of the color red, we think of red peppers or red apples. When we think of the color orange, we think of an orange or perhaps a squash or a carrot. When we think of the color yellow, we think of a yellow pepper or maybe even a yellow tomato or squash. And then green is easy. There's lots of def definitely a lot of green fruits and vegetables. You can have a green apple, zucchini, peas, lettuce, and then blue, blueberries, purple. You can have eggplant or purple carrot. The variety is endless. You want to aim for about 8 to 10 servings per day, about 2 to 4 from the fruit group and 4 to 7 from the vegetable group. Now, serving sounds like a lot, but it doesn't have to be overwhelming, and that's what I want to make sure that you can take away from this presentation. A serving is actually only a small piece of fruit, half a cup of chopped fruit, a cup of lettuce, or a cup of whole berries that are not chopped. So if you think about it, an average dinner salad or lunchtime salad can definitely fit at least three to four servings from the fruit and vegetable group. It aims to put a lot of color in there or make a stir fry or think of some fun and easy ways to add more fruits and vegetables to your diet. Another reason why I really like to talk about fruits and vegetables and their, their beneficial cancer-fighting properties, I like to put it as an analogy if you think of your body like a nice, clean, crisp white shirt, that would be something that you would want to take care of and make sure that if you got a stain on that shirt, you'd want to get it out as soon as possible. And you'd want to use a nice, strong detergent. So if you think of your body in the same manner, the antioxidants and phytochemicals that are in fruits and vegetables are actually our body's detergent to help our body fight cancer and fight disease. That's why they're such a critical part of a healthy cancer-fighting diet. So how can we kind of take all the, these ingredients that I've just talked about and put it all together to make sure that we're getting healthy cancer-fighting ingredients in our foods, high fiber in our foods? Well, if there's one thing I can press upon you, it's a great way to think of it as back to basics, essentially. Keep it simple. You want to look for simple understandable ingredients. And I'll give you a great example on the next slide. So for example, if the front of the package says strawberries, you definitely want to see strawberries in the ingredient list and not something that says artificial flavor. Another good rule of thumb is the rule of five. So you want to think about sugar, fiber, and all the ingredients in a nutrition facts label. But if I can oversimplify it for you just to kind of make it easy to understand at quick glance, what do I need to look for? You definitely want fiber more than five grams and try to keep your sugar as low as possible, ideally less than five grams. So if you're looking at a package, let's say a breakfast cereal or pasta, try to make sure that it has at least five grams of fiber per serving. If you're thinking about breads and rolls and maybe something that you're going to make a sandwich, then it might be best to look for at least three grams per serving. There are definitely less breads out there that contain five grams, but the rule of thumb for a bread is at least three grams per serving, which is typically one slice. And definitely keep an eye out for labels that have too many ingredients. And here you'll see an example of that. On this slide, you can see the first ingredient says whole grain corn. So off the top of the bat, you'd probably think, well, you know, that looks great based on what we've just talked about. But then as you delve a little further into the label, you'll see inulin. Inulin is actually an added fiber. And then as you delve even further into the label, you'll see additives. You'll see natural and artificial flavor, sucralose, and acid sulfame potassium, which are actually artificial sweeteners. So right off the bat, the front of this package may say 100% whole grain. It may even say low in fat, low in sugar specifically because they use artificial sugars, 
But when you look at the food label, that definitely clues you in that maybe this isn't the best food to choose. So as I said on the earlier slide, keeping it simple, definitely try to choose foods that don't have an extended list of ingredients. Because chances are, you know, something that's healthy and natural and good for you is a whole food. It doesn't need to have a list of 10, 15, or 20 ingredients. So the other key component that we were talking about in terms of achieving and maintaining a healthy weight and getting that proper energy balance that we spoke of earlier is lower fat intake. And the reason for this is because, like I said earlier, a lot of times we don't see the hidden sources of fat in our diet. And not only is high fat linked to things like heart disease, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and also, of course, weight gain and cancer. We want to choose lean proteins. And we can do this by looking into the dairy products that we eat, being sure to choose non-fat or skim milk, consuming low-fat or non-fat cheeses, and low-fat or non-fat yogurts. Some people also prefer to choose dairy alternatives, things like soy milk, rice milk, or almond milk, and their counterparts, yogurt and cheeses. When it comes to meats, you want to try to choose the leanest meat possible, white meat, chicken, and turkey, and lean pork. Now, a lot of times people say to me, well, I don't really prefer the white meat as much because it tends to dry out. It's definitely more chewy and not necessarily as appetizing to them. Well, a great way to make sure that your white meat is tender, juicy, and palatable is to marinate it first. So perhaps think about marinating it in some olive oil and some of your favorite spices and then cooking it or cooking it more quickly, like in a stir fry, might help to preserve some of the moisture in those meats. Try to consume fish a little bit more often. And I know for some people, they may not be accustomed to eating fish regularly. It might be more of something that you get when you're out at a restaurant, because it's just not something that people are accustomed to cooking themselves. But believe it or not, fish can actually cook more quickly than their meat counterparts they actually um, can cook in less time. So if you're preparing a quick and healthy meal for dinner on a weeknight, fish is actually a great option. Things like tilapia or salmon um, are great. And even if you needed to use a canned version, they have lower sodium versions of, let's say, wild salmon that you can put on top of a salad and find a really great way to sneak in more fish into your diet. And limiting red meat is also important, and it's an important component of a cancer-fighting diet as well. Ideally, I usually tell my patients to limit red meat to less than twice per week. You want to kind of see where you're at and where your goal will be. Um, some people eat more red meat. They may be used to eating red meat significantly more than that, and I would suggest that you start by making small changes and perhaps reduce it as best you can ultimately until you can get it to less than twice per week. And there are some people who actually, you know, use meat, red meat more on special occasions or don't eat it at all, and that's, that's, that's great as well. But definitely keep that goal in mind. Red meat actually also has a lot more of the saturated fat that we know is not healthy for our hearts. So since I just mentioned saturated fat, I want to give you a little bit more background on how to choose the right types of fats. Because we're saying lower fat intake, but one thing we want to make sure is that we don't lower fat intake and omit the right types of fat and the healthy fats that our body needs. First off, we want to eat more omega-3 fats. So this comes from things like fish, nuts, seeds, canola oil, flax, and even fish oil supplementation, which if that is something that you do, just make sure you do so under the guidance and discretion of your physician. Omega-3 fat is important for its anti-inflammatory properties. Really good for heart health and, and reducing inflammation in your body, which as I mentioned earlier, inflammation can be a precursor to many chronic diseases. We also want to eat more monounsaturated fats. Monounsaturated fats are the type of fat found in olive oil, and that makes olive oil so famous. They're found in avocados. Canola oil actually also has monounsaturated fat. 
and also nuts and seeds. So a good source of mono fats is actually almonds. So almonds are a great top to a salad, or let's say a crust, like make almond crusted um, chicken or a turkey dish. And um, you know they're a great way to kind of sneak in some of these healthy plant fats um, and avoid more of the unhealthy animal fats. So we want to also be aware of omega-6 fat. Omega-6 fat is a polyunsaturated fat. It's actually also a polyunsaturated fat, similar to how omega-3 is as well. But the reason why we want to eat a little bit less of omega-6 and a little bit more of the omega-3 is that the omega-6 can actually potentially promote inflammation in our body. It's not a hard one to avoid because a lot of the foods that contain more omega-6 fats are actually processed foods, things that we shouldn't really include in our diet, things like crackers, cookies, chips, baked goods, etc. And as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about red meat, we definitely want to be aware of reducing our saturated fat intake. This comes from things like fast foods, full-fat dairy products, the skin of poultry and meat, and tropical oils, things like palm oil. Interesting to note, you will see palm oil more often on a food label. And the reason for that is that a lot of times when they're saying trans fat free, they're replacing the oil with palm oil. So even though they're reducing the trans fat in that food, it'll contain more saturated fat. Once again, even more important to read that food label and know what's in your food and what you're buying. So now that we've discussed some healthy components of a cancer-fighting diet, we're going to talk a little bit about eating the right portion. And the reason why portion is so important is because too much of even a healthy food can potentially be more calories than you need and promote weight gain. So how do you know where to begin? Well, it's really interesting because there was a study that showed that people who were given larger bowls and larger plates actually consumed 16% more than people who had a regular sized plate. And how does this connect? Well, a lot of times the portions are extremely large when we take out or eat out at restaurants and in areas where we don't have control over the right amounts. So one good tool I like to use to help you identify the right portion and kind of eyeball the right way and the right balance to eat is something called the New American Plate. The New American Plate is a concept that was developed by the American Institute for Cancer Research. And you can learn a lot more about this whole program by logging on to their website. And they have tons of great resources on how to put the New American Plate to work for you. But to describe it in a basic fashion, essentially, if you think of your plate, you want to have one third or less of that plate come from animal protein. So as you see here, the example, that piece of chicken is on a third or less of the plate. And the rest of the plate is actually filled with plant foods, healthy foods that have lots of good phytonutrients, antioxidants, and chemicals that help fight disease. So here you see a great serving of broccoli. It looks like it's some brown rice and some carrots or beans. So when you're thinking of your plate, try to use this concept and think, I want to make my plate the new American plate. Another good way to think of a portion is if you're looking at a piece of chicken or a piece of meat, a third or less of your plate, or if you're planning it out in terms of portion, it's always great to use the palm of your hand. The palm of your hand can help you to identify what a portion should be. So if you think of a deck of cards or the inner palm of your hand excluding your fingers, that's a great way to identify what a portion of meat should be, about three ounces. If you think of your, your fist, kind of like the size of a baseball, that's approximately one cup. And that's about what the size of a serving, like say a grain, a starch, let's say some rice or some beans that you want on your plate. And then in terms of fruits and vegetables, it's usually about a half a cup if it's chopped and a cup, a cup of, let's say, lettuce or salad or something like that. 
And usually with those foods, I don't necessarily make people stick to that as a minimum because they're so low in calories and so good for you that even if you had a couple of extra spears of broccoli or an extra bowl of salad, as long as it's not doused in unhealthy dressing, that's a great way to fit more lower calorie foods into your diet and good cancer fighting foods. I had to throw this slide in there because I thought it really kind of proved the point. And it's really interesting to note that since the year 1960, the sizes of the average dish or serving, the serving dish that we eat off of has increased by 22%. And that's what we're accustomed to. But believe it or not, for those folks who were eating off of the smaller plates in 1960, they didn't have to go back and fill up their plate to be equivalent to the size that we're used to eating. Because that's actually the amount that we're supposed to be eating. A smaller plate does actually get you accustomed to a smaller appetite. So just kind of a concept to think about. And just be aware, do you really need to go back for seconds? Obviously, if you're somebody who maybe has finished treatment and might need to put on a little bit more weight because you've lost weight, that might be an approach where maybe you do need some extra calories right now. Like that example we talked about in the beginning, energy balance, your energy in may not be as much as you're expending. And you might be more prone to weight loss. So in that case, you may need to choose some more calories. But for those people who are struggling, with achieving and maintaining a healthier weight, here's where the energy balance comes in again. Try to choose that smaller plate and that, that correct portion to make sure that your calorie level is appropriate. So the other piece of the energy balance equation was energy expenditure. And that's where physical activity comes in. So why is physical activity so important? And you know, now that it's springtime and it's great weather to get outdoors and start working out, you may have gotten in the mail an advertisement for your local gym having a special, let's say, sign up and swim down for summer. So it's actually a good time to start making some good goals for physical activity. Not only does it help control weight, enhance weight loss, but resistance exercise also helps to increase your metabolism and actually can enhance weight loss even, even further. Physical activity also strengthens your immune system. It can improve your digestion and may also decrease hormone levels, which is very important for those with hormone-related cancers. Believe it or not, active people have approximately a 30% risk reduction of endometrial cancers and a 20% risk reduction of ovarian cancers. So physical activity has really been demonstrated to be of the utmost importance. But for some, I know it can be somewhat stressful. Because, you know, you may not have time in your day to fit in physical activity. Well, here's the recommendations. So let's try to put it in perspective. The American Cancer Society recommends 150 minutes of moderate physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity spread throughout the week. Now, that's the key. Spread throughout the week. So you can fit it in when you have time. Even if somebody says to you, well, you know, you should really try to work out for 30 minutes after work. If that doesn't fit into your schedule, that's okay. Because 10 minutes spread out three times a day is actually equivalent to 30 minutes of exercise all at once. So even if you're somebody who can take a walk around the block at work or come home from work, come home, relax, eat dinner, and then maybe go for a nice stroll now that the weather is a little bit nicer, there's different, definitely ways to fit in smaller bouts of exercise, maybe just a little bit more frequently throughout the day and throughout the week. Here's some easy exercise tips. Certainly this list is not limited. Um, there's lots of other ideas that we can think of and talk about. I know, I know a popular one that people always hear when you're reading, let's say, different tips on different websites and different books that you may have um, come across in, in, your, in your time in searching for healthy lifestyle tips, everyone always says, park farther in the parking lot. Take that extra step. And you know what? It does make a difference. Walk 10 to 15 minutes during lunchtime. 
It also helps your body improve the digestion after a meal. And just like I said earlier, maybe squeeze in 10 minutes of ex exercise in the morning. Even if it's a matter of finding a channel on the TV where you can do some stretches and maybe just a little bit to get your body moving in the morning before you jump in the shower is a great way to start fitting in some exercise. What about during tele television commercials? You know, it's funny. I just saw a post by um, a healthcare professional that uh, that I kind of follow on you know on on a, a Twitter feed, and she had a great, great, great way of describing the importance of physical activity. And the way she said it was sitting is the new smoking of our generation. We definitely sit a lot more than our counterparts back in the day. We sit, a lot of us sit at work, a lot of us come home, relax, sit in front of the television to unwind. We're definitely not as active as we should be. So try to think of unique ways when you have a break where you can just get up and move. Here's a unique one. Even before you leave for the day, if you have the stamina, walk up and down the stairs three times before you leave. That's just kind of a fun way to just throw it in in the morning before before you head out for the day for work. You don't even have to invest in expensive equipment. You can even lift a can, like let's say a can of tomato sauce or a can of beans. Use any kind of resistance to help work your muscles. Even cleaning the house, vacuuming, dusting, cleaning, all of that is a great way to fit in physical activity. Okay. So I know we've talked about a lot of concepts tonight. And I want to kind of try to put it all together for you in a nice package so that you can kind of have a good takeaway message of how do I take all this information and make it practical for me and my lifestyle. Well, as you see here, and the reason why I like this slide so much is it's emphasizing the importance of color and variety. You see fish. You see colorful carrots. You see colorful beets. You see let's say some squash or melon and cauliflower in the background. Variety is really the key, and that's the component that you want to add more of your, to your diet. So what do we think of when we think of a healthy cancer-fighting diet and lifestyle? First off, we want to limit alcohol consumption. And these, all these recommendations are based off of the American Institute for Cancer Research and the, com the important components of a healthy cancer-fighting diet. For a woman, that should really be one drink or less per day. We also, as we talked about this evening, want to maintain a healthy weight. We can do so by limiting our intake of fatty foods, especially those of animal origin. And that's the concept that we were talking about today, trying to lower our fat intake, be more aware of the condensed source of calories, and not only that, be more aware of healthy fats that can actually provide good nutrition to our body. And of course, we run through the anatomy of a whole grain. And I, hopefully, you can take away and have a better understanding of how to choose more dietary fiber and whole grains in your diet. Whole grains, beans, legumes, those could all help you to increase your dietary fiber. And as we mentioned, the goal is 25 to 35 grams per day. Sounds like a lot, but you don't really, you're probably not that far off. The average American eats about 10 grams per day. So slowly but surely, if you can work your way up to that goal, that would be great to include more fiber and more of the phytonutrients in those foods. Just be sure, if you do include more dietary fiber, to do so slowly. And be sure to drink plenty of fluids throughout the process to avoid constipation, which can actually occur if you're increasing fiber too quickly and if you're increasing it without enough fluids. Increase your intake of nuts, seeds, and fish to at least two to three times per week. And nuts and seeds, you can include them every day, especially on things like salads, in yogurts, um, on top of oatmeal and breakfast cereals are a great way to sneak in the powerful plant properties of nuts and seeds as well. And these foods are so important because this is the group and these are the foods that actually contain more of those healthy omega-3 fats, those anti-inflammatory fats, 
and those heart healthy fats that we talked about earlier. Exercising at least 150 minutes per week and fitting in little bouts wherever you can. Eating at least 8 to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables per day and make 8 to 10 your goal. If you're only consuming, let's say, 3 or 4 right now, you can slowly work up to that. Just try to include more variety and color in your diet. And make educated decisions when you're choosing supplements and evalu evaluating the latest food trend. Because chances are if something sounds too good to be true, likely it is. And make sure that you discuss it with your healthcare team, your registered dietitian, and someone who can help you sort out the fact from the fiction and make sure something that you read or that you're interested in actually has evidence and science to support it. Ideally, these concepts can be things that you can take away from this lecture tonight so that you can stay healthy and reduce your risk of cancer recurrence. I want to thank you for participating, but I also want to remind you that we're going to have part two of this series two weeks from tonight on June 5th, where we're going to take all the concepts that we discussed tonight and put it into a really practical action plan for healthy living. Now we're going to have time for some questions and answers, and I'm sure um, you know, nutrition is usually a very hot topic, so I'm sure all of you have a lot of good questions, and I look forward to hearing them. Here's our contact information in case you would all like additional contact information for both the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition and Meals to Heal. Now we can open the floor for questions. Jessica, I do have a question here. I can hear. Great. Um, what came from uh, during the session, um, shouldn't we eliminate all dairy since evidence indicates that protein in dairy products stimulate the production of insulin like growth factors linked with a higher growth of cancer cells? That's actually a good question, and I, I know dairy is a common concern, especially um, in patients that I see with breast and ovarian cancers, as there's, there's been some kind of periodic research on the topic. Unfortunately, we still don't have a, a definitive consensus that you absolutely have to stay away from dairy, and it, it's not necessarily the protein that's really the issue. Um, some of what's been looked at, especially specific to ovarian cancer, is actually the the milk sugars, the lactose and the galactose that are actually in, in the dairy products. Um, but once again, it's, it's not necessarily something that in the oncology nutrition community we officially consider as a consensus um, to recommend avoiding um, you know, for all patients. I, I think it's an individual approach. Um, if you're somebody who, um, let's say, you know, you really need to get enough calcium in your diet. Dairy is actually a really good source of calcium. Um, if at all, you know, you have any concern specific to your individual case, there are a lot of great dairy alternatives um, that I have, you know, I have tons of patients who also use soy milk and almond milk and rice milk, like I said earlier. So there are, there are alternatives. It's not um, an absolute, so it's not something you absolutely have to do with. But I think um, if you wanted to evaluate it individually, for your specific case, it might be best to talk with an oncology dietitian to see if that makes sense for you and your diet and your nutritional needs. But once again, not a consensus and not something that everybody has to do. If anybody has any questions, you can just type them in. Jessica, you mentioned that in, in the presentation, you said all fruits and vegetables contain potential cancer-fighting nutrients. 
Is there any one specific or any specific fruit or vegetable? That's actually a great question. People do ask me that. Um, ideally, I tell people that they are all great because the variety is really the key component. Because if you concentrate, let's say, let's say you know, we all know berries, like blueberries have great amounts of antioxidants. But if you're somebody who's eating only blueberries and not including a lot of other colorful plant foods, then you're kind of missing out on the balance and the benefits of those other foods. So it's really, all of them really contain specific phytonutrients that are helpful. Um, it's not just necessarily the deep colored ones because even even white, you think of like garlic or onion, even those contain helpful um, plant nutrients that also have you know powerful uh, disease fighting properties. So it's you want to include really the variety is the key and including um, the various colors of the rainbow. and that's really the best way to ensure that your body is getting um, you know the the good balance of phytonutrients that exist in nature. Essentially, I like to describe nature and, and plant foods. It's Mother Nature's pharmacy, Mother's na Mother Nature's way of keeping us healthy and free of disease. Um, even if you think of what what a plant food looks like, you know, like if you look at a cross section of a carrot, kind of looks like an iris or like an eye. And we all know carrots are rich in beta carotene, which are very good for vision. So, um, really, Mother Nature's pharmacy, and just try the variety is key, and the and a, a, full spectrum of colors as best you can. Another question, is honey a good cancer, cancer fighting food? I didn't hear what the, what was the food? Honey. Oh, honey. Yeah, you know, honey, um, honey is a good replacement for, um, for sugar. So definitely that's, and it has to be like kind of a natural honey, not kind of, um, you know, the, a processed honey, let's say. Um, but one thing you do want to be aware of is if, you know, if you're still, let's say, intermittently going through cancer treatment, you do want to make sure that if you do consume honey that it is pasteurized because that is important. Um, but, yes, honey is, a, is considered, you know, part of, it's a, nat a food from nature. So honey in itself has a lot of good disease-fighting properties. I know honey has been used a lot, um, and I've read some research with honey as it relates to um, you know, fighting off like colds and, and coughs and things like that, like some of the phytonutrients in, in honey are actually helpful um, in the antioxidants in, in, in helping kind of boost, I guess, boost an immune response during, um, during kind of seasonal illnesses. Um, but, but yeah, you can certainly include, and, but in, you know, in the right portion, it's still a, a sweetener, obviously. Um, so you'd really just probably only want to use a teaspoon or two if you're sweetening it, let's say, in an oatmeal or something like that. Is there an upper limit on an amount of nuts that should be eaten daily? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm glad you mentioned that, um, as I should have reviewed the portion when we were talking about nuts. Think of it about a palm full. So if you kind of cup your hand um, and you kind of level off the top of your hand from um, the cup of your palm, it's about a palm full or um, about a quarter of a cup of nuts. So, um, you know, definitely nuts because they have that healthy fat, are more concentrated in calories. So, you know, it's it's easy to kind of pop nuts, and, if, you know, especially even though we don't want to eat them this way. Um, a lot of times if they're salted and roasted, they have a great taste. But ideally, you do want to eat them plain because then you don't have to worry about all the added calories and oils that are added in the roasting process. And you do want to stick to, to about that portion um, if you're adding it to, let's say, salads and, um, and oatmeal and yogurts and things like that. Also, is there a limit on the amount of avocado? Is a half of an avocado a reasonable size serving? Actually, what we use for avocado um, is about an eighth of an avocado as a serving. So another great question, because once again, avocado, things like guacamole are really easy and really delicious to eat more than we need. Um, but if you kind of think of an eighth of an avocado as is, is Basically, it's like a slice because avocado, because it has a lot of that monounsaturated fat, also, once again, can be concentrated in calories. So great healthy foods, lots of good health benefits, but just be aware not to have too much. Another question. Um, I've heard quite a bit about decreasing inflammation in your body with good diet, et cetera. Could you explain exactly what this is? Certainly, that's a great question, and we touched a little bit on anti-inflammatory um, parts of the diet, 
um, earlier when we were talking about omega-3 fat. So the, the kind of the starting point is that omega-3 fat. So we want to choose foods that have more of this anti-inflammatory, um, it's a polyunsaturated fat that reduces inflammation. So the way we do that is by, A, choosing more uh, proteins that have omega-3 fats. So a lot of anti-inflammatory type diets will include more fish. Like if you think of it almost like the Mediterranean diet. So you're going to include more salmon, tuna, mackerel, things like that, and preferably the wild sourced. You're also going to include more um, things like canola oil have actually a, a good amount of the plant source of omega-3. You're also going to include things like walnuts. Walnuts are a great source of omega-3 fat, and also flaxseed as well. And then you're also going to include, in terms of anti-inflammatory, not only do we think of omega-3 fats, but we also think of the anti-inflammatory properties of certain foods. So we know for sure um, things like kind of darker colored fruits and vegetables, things like um, darker leafy greens, things like um, cranberries, cherries, blueberries, things that have um, more plant chemicals that are actually known to have um, reduced, you know, reduced inflammatory properties in the body. So ideally, if you think of kind of what we've talked about today, choosing more healthy fats, kind of focusing on more plant foods is a great foundation for an anti-inflammatory diet. Here's another question. What about grilled foods? Oh, that's a great question, especially considering that we're almost in the summer season. Um, certainly, grilled foods, especially if it's grilled in a barbecue where there's an open flame, um, that's known to create heterocyclic amines and chemicals that potentially can, um, you know, become carcinogenic when ingested. So, what we want to do to kind of it, it, you know, grilled foods, and you can even see this in, in large organizations and recommendations from, from groups like the American Institute for Cancer Research. Obviously, you know, in the summertime, no one's saying that you could never have a barbecued item or a grilled item, but maybe you want to do it a little bit more healthfully in a way where we can reduce those potentially carcinogenic compounds. And the way to do so is by potentially you know, pre-cooking some of the meat first. Um, so let's say you're going to make grilled chicken. You might want to cook it a little bit and then kind of just finish it on the grill. Um, marinating meats, um, as we talked about earlier, not only makes them tender, but that's actually also a wonderful way to reduce the absorption of those HCAs, those heterocyclic amines, and dangerous chemicals into that food. Um, potentially another way is you can also cover the grill with foil so that um, the open flame is not actually touching the food, so you're still getting the enjoyment of cooking outdoors. Um, but it's not actually touching the flame. Because it's really the, the dripping of the fat and the juices from the meats touching the flame and then kind of encircling the food that, that, um, that causes the danger. So that's another option as well. So um, those are some things you can do to make grilling as helpful as possible. Um, here's one. Um, I hear a lot that eating sugar with cancer is like putting fuel on a fire. Is that true with carbs? And what about? I was waiting for this. What? Yeah, I was waiting for this question. That's usually one of the number one questions I get asked. I figured it would come up eventually. So um, yeah, so that's a very, very common concern among cancer patients and cancer survivors is sugar. You know that they they you know worry is that sugar feeds cancer. And essentially, um, it, it, there's really not a direct relationship, as it may seem. Believe it or not, sugar feeds. All of the cells in our body, and and the food that we break, the, when we break down food and it's broken down into simple forms of energy, it's broken down into glucose from all different sources. So even if you totally removed sugar from your diet, um, your body can actually still convert proteins and fats to glucose if need be. So um, cancer cells need energy just like all other cells in our body. So there's not that direct link. The, the importance of being aware of sugar in your diet comes from more of an overall health perspective because not only can excess sugar consumption contribute to higher calorie intake and weight gain, um, but also, and this is an, the important part, is that a really high sugar diet can cause the body to produce higher amounts of insulin. Insulin is the hormone that actually helps your body to take that glucose into your cells and use it for energy. So with higher amounts of insulin in the body for somebody who eats a ton of sugar, 
the insulin itself is what can potentially kind of put your body in a more cancer-friendly environment because insulin can promote growth. So it's not necessarily to avoid all sorts, all sources of sugar in your diet. What it is is important to do is eat a well-balanced diet. What we're talking about today, essentially, consuming more natural sources of sugar and using all of the unhealthy sources in moderation. You know, obviously, you can enjoy a birthday cake, or ice cream, or um, things like that here and there, but it shouldn't really be a big part of your diet. You know, you want to avoid concentrated juices, sodas, fruit drinks, sweets, desserts, cakes, cookies, candies, things like that, because they're not healthy to begin with, whether you have cancer or not. And then choose more natural sources, um, like I said, fruits and vegetables and things that are kind of giving your body um, good cancer-fighting ingredients and in the natural form. Um, healthy unprocessed foods is really the way to go. And then using, you know, other sweets in moderation and not making them, you know, a, 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 an important part of your diet by any means. It's, it's more about really, it's, it's that whole sugar and cancer concept, I always say, it's more of a sensationalized way of really bringing it down to basics, like that term I used earlier, that what it's all about is really a good foundation of a healthy diet, a healthy, well-balanced diet. Jessica, here's a couple of questions in there. I'm, I'm going to group them together, um, and this really to sum it up. Um, many of us have issues of bowel obstruction. Um, higher fiber becomes an issue with low residual diet is recommended. How do you recommend reintroducing those high fiber foods and avoiding recurrence of the obstruction? That's a great question. Um, you have definitely have to be more careful if you're somebody who's prone to any type of bowel obstruction and um, typically what you may be, be able to tolerate more, um, and obviously do so under the, um, under the guidance of your medical team. I wouldn't, you know, recommend that you include fiber on your own, you know, only under their approval and guidance. But um, you may be able to tolerate more soluble fibers, things that don't have as much bulk and roughage. Soluble fibers are from things like um, things like oatmeal, things like um, apples and applesauce, things that they actually um, have, soluble fiber forms a gel. It absorbs extra water in your intestines, but it's not the bulk of insoluble fiber, which is the outer skins of the fruits and the vegetables and things like that, that can actually form more bulk and potentially contribute more so to a blockage. The other key, um, and for those who are kind of already on a low fiber diet, the key is also, um, Cooking fruits and vegetables tends to break down some of the fibers and make them much easier to digest. So if you're somebody who's been on a much lower fiber diet and is allowed to transition slowly, um, like I said, A, um, definitely if you can, try to meet with an oncology dietitian. Um, if you don't have one in your area, you can certainly call us at Meals to Heal and we would be happy to try to connect you with somebody in your area. Um, but it's important to do so with the, with the help of a dietitian if possible because um, you may want to slowly include some more well-cooked vegetables that are tender enough to cut with a fork, um, and even cooked fruits like canned fruits in their own juice, um, you know, things like a baked apple um, might be a really good way to start, just because it's definitely more tolerable to introduce them in a cooked form. Um, but an important situation, and I'm glad that you brought that to my attention, because definitely, um, Bowel obstructions are definitely not something that you want to mess with because they could be very painful. And I know when, um, especially when they recur, it's, it's difficult to find the right balance in your diet. So I would definitely recommend trying to seek specific and individualized attention and advice from a registered dietitian if possible. What about soy? Is that safe to eat? Yeah, actually, believe it or not, um, that's another common misconception. And, you know, probably about 10 years ago, there was still some conflicting evidence on soy that made it very confusing. Um, and a lot of times we were kind of steering toward um, lower amounts in the diet. But believe it or not, more of the current research has actually demonstrated that it is safe for cancer survivors with histories of hormonal cancers. Um, that there's no, um, you know, real risk. And two to three servings per day is generally what the oncology nutrition realm kind of uses as a guide as, um, as a safe amount. So that would include whole soy foods. So you really, you don't need to add soy supplements by any means because 
in the isolated form, that's probably where there's going to be some um, some concern and that it might not be the best fit or, um, because it's got concentrated forms of, of a food that you don't necessarily need. So whole, so whole soy foods is always what we recommend, things like soy milk, um, soy yogurt, soy beans, soy nuts are the best way. If you do include soy in your diet, that's the best and healthful way to do so. Um, but if, if you have an individual concern about your own specific diagnosis as it relates to soy intake, once again, I think it would be best to discuss with a registered dietitian as well because a lot of times as oncology dietitians, we also take into account family history, um, other uh, medical history and so forth um, to make individual and specific recommendations for particular patients. But the general consensus is that um, whole soy foods are, are definitely safe in moderation and in balance. Great questions, by the way. You guys are, are great. I think this is a, another question here, and it, and it goes back to um, when you talked about milk. Is raw milk and cheese is okay since they haven't been pasteurized? Yeah, generally we don't really recommend foods that aren't pasteurized, especially since um, if you're undergoing treatment or having recently finished treatment, um, you know, your immune system may be a little bit weaker and, you know, that's definitely not something that you want to take a chance with. So it's not, it's not really something that I would recommend. I think pasteurized foods are definitely much safer in terms of ensuring that there's no, um, you know, bacterial component that can make you sick. Um, you know, I, I know some people who kind of, um, you know, maybe you make their own yogurt, but I think that might be a little bit different because they're starting with pasteurized milk. Um, but that's probably the only scenario where I, where I might um, kind of work with that patient and condone it. But otherwise, um, I usually don't recommend foods that aren't, you know, don't go through that extra safety process of pasteurization. Well, great. Um, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Meals to Heals. Thank you, Genentech. Um, I do want to let you know that this uh, webinar has been recorded, um, and we will be sending you a link along with the PowerPoint presentation so you can review it. Um, I do want to stress that we do have part two, June 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern, creating an action plan for healthy living. Thank you very much, and have a good evening.